and crops with uh, Gateway Greening. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things first. Um, everybody, because this is like a presentation mode, um, so everyone is automatically muted. Um, so if you have questions, um, we welcome any and all questions you have. Um, but the way to ask those questions will be through the, the Q&A or the chat function. Um, so you can just type in your question there. Um, and we have another staff member who's on this call um, who will be working to answer those questions. Um, or if she is unable to answer the question, then um, at the end of the presentation, she will ask me the question verbally and I will answer it as best as I can. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in there and we will answer those one way or another. Um, also, I will uh, we'll be sending this presentation out to everyone um, after this. So if you um, miss something, you're trying to take a note or write down a variety or something like that, um, we will send this out to you. So don't um, worry too much about that as we go through. Um, so yeah, I think that is about it. So we will get started here. Um, Sorry, my computer charger is being a little weird, which is why it's not currently in presentation mode. But we will get started. Um, so, like I said, so this is Blind Crops. Um, I'm sure you all saw the description, and that's how you got here. Um, but we will be talking about trellising, pruning, and care of vine crops, um, and specifically grapes and kiwis. Um, so, we're talking about kind of the woody um, vines. So, we're not talking about pole beans or you know cucumbers or anything like that. Um, we're talking about basically just grapes and kiwis. Um, you also have to forgive this random blinking box. We have no idea what it is, um, but it's shown up the last couple classes we have. So uh, it's annoying, but it shouldn't be in the way of any information. So, <clears throat> so first, um, I like to always kind of go over what our recommendations are based on. Um, so when uh, I'm giving you lists of varieties, um, or I'm talking about, you know, what trellises to use or things like that. Um, we select those based on ease of growth, um, primarily. So um, when we're looking at varieties, so determining kind of what crops we're going to talk to you about. Um, so, you know, like why we chose grapes. Um, and then more specifically, like when we're talking about what varieties of grapes, um, what those selections are based on is, um, is local adaptation, so you know how well it grows here. So we're not going to be talking about, you know, a tropical crop that you would have to, you know, put in a greenhouse or do like very extensive care for because it's not very well adapted to our location and it'd be a lot of work, and that's not easy. Um, probably the single largest one, especially for grapes, is disease resistance, um, and we'll talk about why that is here in a bit. Um, and then also, obviously, taste. If it doesn't taste good, it doesn't really matter how easy it is to grow. Um, and then diversity. Um, so that's, you know, not like we don't just find one variety and we're like, this is the best, only grow this. Um, we like to have, you know, quite a few on hand so that you have um, diversity to pick from and so that, you know, if something new comes along that really impacts that variety that you don't lose everything. Um, and then our management practices. Um, so like, you know, again, we're talking about like trellising or pruning or things like that. Um, we're selecting those um, kind of based on the same thing, so for ease. So we're selecting ones that are gonna minimize your work um, and minimize disease and pests. Um, so what that means is there are a lot of other ways to do these things. There are a lot of other, you know, like I, I, I have a list I think in here of about 10 to 12 kind of grapes. There are thousands and thousands of grapes. There are encyclopedias written on grape culture. Um, and so there are lots of other ways to do it. Um, our way is far from the only way to do this. Um, it's just the way that we have found the easiest um, for those who aren't, you know, hardcore, um, you know, grape and kiwi growers. Um, and, you know, so that the management, um, or sorry, uh, those who aren't hardcore and want to minimize their management um, and want to avoid chemicals as much as possible. Um, so, you know, there's lots of other grapes, but they might have, you know, a lot more diseases. So you need to do a lot more chemicals to even get a crop. So we generally don't talk about those. Um, so we're trying to find those easy ones to grow. 
So um, when we talk about vine crafts, uh, like I said a little bit earlier, we're talking about specifically woody perennial vines. So we're not talking about pole beans, cucumbers, anything like that. Um, and primarily what we're going to be talking about today is grapes and hardy peas. Those are really the only two um, that you would want to grow probably a lot of. They're by far the most common. Um, we're going to talk about muscadines just a little bit at the end um, because we're still a little unsure how, how well they'll do here. Um, we're going to talk about those a little bit. Um, there are some other woody perennial vines that you can grow here, like those two that you see there, um, Shisandra and Akibia, um, that we're not really going to talk about. Uh, they're not very common. They're not really, they're more like kind of medicinals or little snacks or things like that. Uh, they're very interesting and you should look into them if you're, if you're interested, um, but we're not going to be going over any specifics of those today. Um, and then these are just pictures. Um, down this bottom one is grapes, um, and this one up the top is um, is muscadine or muscadine. Um, so the muscadine, like I said, it's um, we're a little unsure of how well they'll do here, but it's essentially a different type of grape. Um, as you can see, they look they look a lot like grapes, um, but they are a little different. You can see the bunches are a little different, the fruit's a little bigger, and we'll talk about those differences as well. Um, so the reason why we have a whole separate class on vine crops, um, separate from all of our other classes where we're talking about um, fruits and um, not producing kind of trees and shrubs, is that um, vines need support their entire life and they get very heavy. Um, so this means that you need a substantial, long-lasting trellis. Um, it's, I mean, it's really essential um, because if you don't have a trellis, you're, you're really going to get little to no fruit. Um, at least that is that is usable. Um, diseases are going to be much more common. Um, production is going to be much lower. Uh, it's, I mean, there's really nobody who grows these plants without a trellis. Um, it's, it's just really not heard of um, because naturally they're, I mean, they're vines. They do climb. They um, kind of evolved with trellises. It's just the trellises before humans cultivated them were were other trees and plants. Uh, they're also different in the sense that you prune off way more of the vine each year than you do from a tree or a shrub um, because the tree is its own support. Um, so you have to leave a lot more of the tree on because it's also its own support. The vine, since you have the trellis there, um, it's really not providing much of its own support. So you, you can and you will be cutting off a lot more. Um, and just as an example, with grapes, you're cutting anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of the grape growth off each year. Um, versus a tree where you're not going to be cutting off more than 30 to 40 percent in any one year. Um, and yeah, like I said, without pruning, you'll get little to no fruit. Um, and the harvest is always within reach is another uh, nice thing about vine crops that is not necessarily the case with trees. Um, because you have the vine as, or the, the trellis, as long as you make the trellis, you know, human height, um, it's always, it's not going to get really any taller than that. Um, when you're looking at locations, if you're trying to decide if you want to do vine crops, um, it's going to be a lot of the same things as really any other uh, fruit. Uh, you're going to want full sun, um, not only for yield, but especially to minimize disease in, um, in your grapes specifically. Kiwis can take a little bit of shade, um, but really you're going to get maximum production in the sun. And for grapes especially, that, um, that full sun is really going to cut down on your disease pressure. Um, you also want well-drained soil. Um, because, like, again, pretty much all fruit, they don't like um, wet soils. You know, if, if you've got a part of your yard or orchard that you're working with and, um, and we have a big storm and there's standing water, that's not the place you want to be planting your grapes or your kiwis. Um, also, good airflow helps. So what that means is, you know, if you've got like a little area that's completely surrounded by trees um, or buildings or something where there's not, um, you know, airflow happening, that it's in kind of like a little um, calm pocket. Um, again, that's not the best, um, and that's just because that good airflow helps um, minimize disease again. Um, and then again, with as with all plants, good quality soil is also good. And if you don't have it, then, you know, then make it. Um, you know, amend your soil, add compost, um, you know, mulch it with wood chips or other organic matter on top, um, break up any major compaction that you might have uh, bef before you plant, ideally, uh, and then continue to improve it as as your plants are growing. 
so grapes um, is what we're going to spend probably the most time talking about um, on this class because they're by far the most um, the most common uh, and they also have the most kind of little caveats and things you need to know um, and that's primarily because grapes can be very difficult to grow here because of disease um, and disease is really the only thing that makes it hard um, you know there's lots of wild grapes there our climate is pretty well adapted to them but most of the varieties that people know and want to grow uh, are are not acclimatized to how humid and hot our summers are and because of that grapes have several very aggressive fungal diseases um, that they have to contend with and that you will have to contend with as a grape grower um, the most kind of severe and extreme of those is um, is black rot and that is where it, and it's interesting because mature fruit and mature leaves are not susceptible um, and so you think oh that's not that bad except um, grapes a lot of times will keep growing kind of throughout the year so there's a supply of new leaves kind of all the time um, and it can happen really fast so you can see kind of this statistic down here so leaves or fruit only need to be wet for six hours when it's 80 degrees outside for this disease to take hold so you know if you try and imagine in the summer we get a rain that rain happens in the evening and so the leaves don't dry out for you know a couple hours because it's not bright and sunny um, it's also usually not very windy um, in the summer around here it only takes six hours for that disease to show up and infect um, any susceptible fruit or leaves um, and it can cause uh, very severe damage especially to the fruit and this picture here is of it um, starting to infect some grapes um, and you can see kind of those um, black um, more kind of brown in this picture kind of spots um, they'll surround and they'll infect all of the fruit it'll just shrivel up into black little hard marble looking things um, and you can't eat that it's not very good um, and just as an example here of kind of how severe those fungal diseases can be um, i was at a, a class on grape growing in missouri here uh, and this was several years ago and it was i think the class was in either july or august and we had had a particularly rainy june um, and they said that the growers growing um, kind of conventional grapes had already sprayed fungicide on their grapes um, it was close to 20 times that year to prevent these fungal infections and so you know most uh, backyard growers don't want to spray at all let alone that often and even if you were willing to do that it's kind of hard to do that unless that's your full-time job that's a lot of a lot of spraying that you need to keep track of um, and it's very important to do it at specific times because as you because like you know, we just talked about it only takes six hours for it to be wet so if you don't have those fungicides on when the leaves are going to be wet it doesn't matter if you sprayed you know a week ago um, so uh, because of that uh, we pick disease resistant varieties um, and to give again kind of an example of that that uh, at that same class they were talking about this and they said um, those growing disease resistant grape varieties that year had only sprayed three times so, you know, just those genetic differences between those that are disease resistant and those that are not is the difference between spraying three times and spraying 20 times. Um, and that's quite a difference. And if your goal is to, um, is not commercial production, it doesn't need to be beautiful, um, maybe you don't need to spray at all if we have, you know, a lucky year, if you're only spraying three times in an incredibly wet year. Um, so it kind of depends. Uh, so picking those diseases and varieties is is really critical if you want low spray to no spray grapes um, and so then the question is which ones should you grow uh, so generally speaking you want grapes with seeds in them which is always kind of a bummer because most people want seedless grapes because that's what you get at the store they're you know uh, what people like the the texture is of seeded grapes is a little different um, but generally speaking, seedless, there really are no seedless grapes that are very, very disease resistant. Um, kind of the, the most disease resistant ones there are are these three listed here, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune, um, that were bred by the University of Arkansas. Um, but even the University of Arkansas says these are disease resistant, but that you still really should spray um, if you want to get a crop. So generally speaking, you're gonna want grapes with seeds in them. Um, and of the varieties that we like, all but one of them are called Munson grapes. Um, there's one that is not a Munson grape that we also like, but um, what are Munson grapes is then the next kind of logical question. Um, and basically all they are is they are grapes that were bred by a man named Munson. 
um, his name was T.V. Munson. Um, he was born in Illinois, did a bunch of breeding of grapes in Texas, um, but uh, he bred, I think, something like two to 300 grapes. It was a lot of grape varieties that he did. Um, and so we don't like all of his grapes, but like I said, of the like 10 to 15 grapes that we do like, all but one of them were bred by him. So um, he did some really good grape breeding for disease resistance. The only one that we like that is not from him um, is one called Edelweiss, um, which was bred by a guy named Elmer Swenson up north. Um, and it's the only green grape we like. So if you really like green grapes, um, Edelweiss is what you want um, in terms of disease resistance. But um, this uh, list here are the Munson varieties that we like. Um, so this list, in addition to Edelweiss, are really the grapes that we find are the best. Um, and our selection of them as being good came actually from a guy named Guy Ames, um, G-U-Y, and then A-M-E-S. Um, and he's down in Fayette, uh, outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, and he took a bunch of Munson grapes and has been breeding them for, or not breeding them, he's been growing them for a couple decades now. And the way that he that he grows them is he you know, plants them, takes care of them, keeps them weeded, keeps them watered, um, keeps them trellised, keeps them pruned, but he doesn't spray at all. And then he just sees which ones don't die. Um, and so the, this list of ones here are ones from him that he has been growing for years that he never sprays, um, but he does manage uh, to minimize disease pressure. Uh, and they all grow and produce grapes without any sprays. And so we've been planting these here in St. Louis for a couple of years now, um, and we've had pretty much the same experience. We've only had one, or it was it was two grapes at one planting that did get some um, some black rot uh, this year, actually, early in the spring when it was really wet. Um, but none of the other ones we've grown have had any disease issues, and they haven't been sprayed at all. Um, so, so far, they've been pretty low maintenance. Um, this year was the first year that any of them produced grapes. Um, and they were all delicious. So they do have seeds, the texture is a little different, um, but they are really good still. They just don't have that real bright crunch that the seedless grapes have. Um, they're a little bit more kind of meaty, kind of almost kind of creamy. Um, they're really good. Uh, they're mostly all bred for wine, so they have really rich um, flavors to them. Uh, and this list of varieties here is also all different colors. So um, everything but um, green. So there's pink ones, there's purple ones, there's black ones, there's blue ones, there's red ones um, in this list here. And so you can you can pick all the different um, grapes you want um, and still have really disease resistant um, grapes from them. And then I would like to tell just this little story because I think it's, uh, it's interesting and it's related to kind of the St. Louis area-ish. Um, so T.B. Munson, the guy who bred these grapes, uh, along with a guy who uh, grew grapes down in Neosho, um, Missouri, uh, together actually kind of saved the global wine industry um, back in the 1800s. Uh, of the, there's like, it's like, I think it's like eight species of grapes, I believe, um, in the world. And one of them grows in, in Europe, in the Middle East. Uh, one grows in China and all the rest grow in the United States or what is now the United States. Um, and so we have an enormous amount of grape diversity here, um, but we also have quite a few pests and diseases that are from here that attack grapes. And so as grapes from the United States moved over to Europe, uh, a pest got introduced to Europe and it started wiping out all of the, the vineyards in France and Italy and Germany at the time. And uh, the, the growers over there, there was one um, official in France specifically who had heard of T.V. Munson's work in the United States and reached out to him. Um, and him and this other grape grower down in Southern Missouri sent over, um, I think they said it was something like 16, like um, like train cars worth of, um, of rootstock um, that was resistant to that disease over to Europe. And then they, and that's what the Europeans started grafting all of their grapes to. And that's still those, um, those kind of lineages of, of grapes that were from Missouri and Texas are still what basically all of the world's grapes are grafted onto. Um, and so the wine industry was saved um, partially by these two men. Um, and what I think is particularly funny about that story and what I like is that T.V. Munson was actually a teetotaler. He didn't drink alcohol. He didn't 
believe in drinking alcohol, thought it was a bad idea, um, but he saved the global wine industry, um, which is always kind of funny. Um, and he was also originally born in uh, Illinois, just about two hours north of St. Louis. So the Midwest kind of saved the, the wine industry, which is kind of cool. So in terms of growing your grapes, um, planting, like, like with anything, is, uh, is a vital first step. Um, so these varieties are much more aggressive than a lot of the more conventional kind of European uh, varieties of grapes that are really common. And so they need to be spaced a little bit further apart. Um, so they're generally best spaced um, from 8 to 12 feet apart along your trellis. Um, so 10 foot's a, a general kind of good rule um, that you can use for that. Um, it's usually a good idea to plant at least two varieties, if for no other reason than to make sure that if you do get a disease, it's probably only going to um, affect one of those uh, with how disease resistant these varieties are. Um, as with most fruit, it's best to not let them produce until the third spring, at least the third spring after they're planted, um, because these are grafted or rooted varieties, so they think they're older than they are. Um, so I've had ones where, um, where I get the, the cuttings that are rooted and they're only you know, six to 12 inches tall and they try and produce bunches of grapes. Um, and if you do that, it's really gonna stunt um, the growth for those first couple years and, and sometimes for the whole life of the vine. So um, for those first two to three years, you really wanna cut off any kind of flowers or fruit that it's trying to form so that it's putting all of its energy into producing roots and, um, and leaves so that you can get a nice um, structure established quickly so that you have a nice big plant to start producing lots of grapes um, once you do allow them to fruit. Um, again, also like with pretty much all plants, you want to um, minimize weed pressure, um, specifically grass. Um, grass is particularly um, competitive with kind of uh, woody plants when they're young. So you want to keep an area ideally about a three foot radius around each grape uh, as weed free as possible. And you can do that with mulch. Um, if you do it with wood chip mulch, it's best to put down some sort of material underneath that, um, whether that's cardboard or burlap bags or um, I mean, even newspaper or something um, that biodegrades. It'll help kind of smother what's already there. Um, and then the mulch will help um, do that. But mulch is not, um, it's not foolproof. I mean, you'll still have to weed. Um, and if you have Bermuda grass particularly, um, the mulch is not going to kill that Bermuda grass. Um, you really need to either um, kind of scalp it off, um, remove that sod altogether, or use an herbicide, or use more of a plastic mulch around there to keep um, that Bermuda grass down. <laughs> um, and it's particularly important to keep Bermuda grass away. Bermuda grass is probably one of the most um, uh, life-sucking weeds from around woody plants. Um, and so when, you're, when your grapes are young, you really want to make sure that you keep uh, Bermuda grass away from them. Uh, you also want to make sure, again, like with all plants, that you keep them watered, especially that first year as they're trying to get established and grow roots. Um, and generally, the best way to do that is if we do not get a significant rain, so, you know, a light drizzle doesn't count, or even if we have a heavy rain, but it's only for like 10 minutes, um, if we don't have like a, you know, a long, nice rain, um, you want to water about once a week. And you want to be adding about three to five gallons of water per plant per week. Again, if we don't get a significant rain for that first year. Um, after that first year, um, you it it helps to keep watering them. Um, but if you're not able to water them, you know, every week, um, or you forget after the first year, it's not as big of a deal as long as you keep them watered. Uh, if we're having a dry spell, um, so like this year, you know, it rained pretty consistently for most of the spring and into the summer, but then it just kind of stopped raining, you know, a month or two ago. Um, so it would be critical to keep, um, to keep them watered during those, um, during those dry spells, um, especially once they start producing grapes, um, because fruit is mostly water. And so if they go through a drought, your yields are gonna be much lower than if you keep them watered. So then trellising is, um, is pretty critical. Like we talked about, it's one of the big differences between vine crops and tree crops. Um, and we prefer the Munson trellis. Um, so it was the trellis that Munson himself designed for the grapes that he bred. Um, and he designed it um, specifically to minimize disease. Uh, and so we like it. Uh, it's not used commonly or really at all in commercial grape production anymore um, because it does take up more space. So you're not able to plant as many grapes per acre. 
And so in the era of just being able to spray magic chemicals that make the disease go away, they'd much rather have more compact trellises so that you can get more grapes planted so that you can get a higher yield. Um, but again, assuming you're not wanting to use lots of chemicals, um, the Munson trellis, which takes up a little bit more space, is a good way to minimize your disease pressure. Um, and uh, it is more work to build um, up front than, than more conventional grape trellises as well. Not by much, but it is a little bit more work. Um, but it also, uh, like I said, helps uh, reduce disease and makes pruning actually easier, in my opinion, um, than some of the more conventional grape trellises. Uh, and it looks like this. It kind of looks like a, like a clothesline. Um, so you've got the posts that stick up out of the ground, and then you've got these little cross arms. And there's a wire that comes um, on each end of the, of the arms, again, a lot like a clothesline. But then um, in addition to that, there's this third wire. And this third wire kind of goes through or along the, the vertical post in the ground. And it's about six inches below um, these wires on the side. Uh, and I'm going to go over all these um, on how to build the trellis just so you understand it and you hear it. Um, but we do also have a step-by-step -step instruction um, guide on how to construct one of these. So you don't need to make notes of every individual thing necessarily, um, like with the spacing and everything. But, um, and so you can see the way that it's growing here, where it grows up, and you're really attaching the grape just to this, um, this lower central wire. Um, but then as you get all the kind of leafy growth that comes out the top, in the spring as it starts growing. What you let it do is you let it kind of flop over and cascade down over these side wires. And so if you're looking down the row of the trellis, it would look kind of like this, where the trunk is coming up, and then there's all these kind of wispy things that are kind of going out to the side. And the way that that helps is what that means then is this central area, this is where your grapes are going to form, is on these um, major side branches. And so your grapes are going to be right there. And if you picture um, along with this, pic, um, with this image on the left, you can see all of the side branches that go out. That's where all the leaves are going to be. And so the leaves are not shading the grapes in the middle, if that makes sense. So that means that when it rains, the sun and the air is going to hit the grapes themselves much more easily than if those leaves were all kind of packed into more of a vertical structure like you see in a lot of vineyards. Um, and so it dries out, um, it helps to dry out more quickly. Uh, which again can help minimize disease. It also makes it easier to see the grapes um, and it also makes it so all these branches are like kind of coming out and so it's easy they're not they don't get tangled as easily it's easier to kind of kind of go um, underneath and up into where the grapes are and you can see where those branches are and you can kind of prune them and cut them um, which is easier to do than um, the way that they're kind of woven in um, into just that kind of two-dimensional kind of horizontal or a vertical plane that you see in a lot of vineyards. Um, currently. So when you're building it, generally you're going to need an, kind of an eight foot four by four um, treated lumber post um, or a fence post. You can use a round post, like a just a conventional fence post if you want, but a square one is easier to attach things to. Uh, and you're going to sink it basically at least two to two and a half feet in the ground. Um, if you can go deeper, that's even better, um, but you really need at least two to two and a half feet into the ground. Um, and the cross arms, uh, are just two foot wide. They don't need to be very long and uh, they can just be made out of two by four, um, again, treated lumber. You can do untreated, but you really don't really want to just because the treated lumber is going to rot much faster um, and then you're going to have to be trying to replace these things as they're potentially hundreds of pounds of grape vine attached to it. And that's an absolute nightmare. So really the treated posts are going to last you um, much longer. Um, and the posts should be spaced, the vertical posts, should be spaced no more than 24 feet apart. Uh, they can be closer depending on how long you want to make the trellis, um, but 24 feet is kind of the span between posts that you want to max out on. So, uh, so it's usually easy to, to kind of um, calculate your trellis in you know 25 foot increments. Um, you're also going to want, actually, you really only need two wire vices, and those are just things, uh, hopefully you can see it, my face isn't in the way. Um, but this top picture here kind of shows one of those. It's where um, the wire can go in one end, uh, but it can't pull back out. So it's a really easy way um, to attach the wire and to pull the wire through to get it taut 
um, without having to try and mess with other um, securing mechanisms. But there's lots of other ways that you can secure um, wire if you need to. But wire vices, um, and you want like a 12 to 13 gauge one because you'll be using 12 gauge galvanized wire as the wires um, for the for the lines for the for the trellising. Um, you'll also want two earth anchors, um, which is what this bottom picture is here, um, which just looks like um, what a lot of people use, like for um, uh, like leashes, like for like to put in the ground, like for dogs, um, or really to secure much of anything. It just it's a screw anchor, so it's just got that vertical shaft on it, and then it's got kind of a corkscrew looking thing at the bottom, and you just screw it into the ground, um, and you're going to have it about four foot away from the last post in your trellis line. And you're going to angle it so that if the post is here, you're going to angle the anchor this way, at kind of a 45 degree angle into the ground. Um, and then you can also attach um, in several different ways, um, but this gripple, that's what this picture is here, um, G-Pack kit um, is kind of the easiest way. It comes with um, a wire, this thing, which you just, you basically just pull and it locks it in place. Um, it's really easy to use. And again, all of these are on this kind of construction plan um, that I'll send out to everybody after this class. So once you, um, you build your trellis um, and you've you know, got your grapes figured out, you've got your varieties that you want, um, you need to figure out how to, how to prune it. Uh, pruning is really critical, especially the first couple of years to get the structure that you want. Um, but it's not all that complicated for grapes. Um, it's just, very foreign to a lot of in a lot of ways because you're pruning so much it's it's kind of shocking um, and so what we like to use there's lots of different ways to prune grapes um, we like the spru the spur pruning method um, it's good for these grapes and it's uh, I I think a simpler one um, kind of to understand and so basically with that what you're going to do is you're going to train the grape to have one trunk and two cordons. So the trunk is, you know, from this picture here that you can see, uh, the trunk is just the, the vertical spot that's, you know, trunk just like on a tree or something um, that goes up. And then uh, it's going to go up to that middle lower wire. And then the cordons are these side branches that go along the wire. So you're going to let that trunk grow up to that height. And then you're either going to cut it or you're going to bend one side down and let another branch go the other way. And you're going to make this kind of T shape. And the arms of the T are the cordons, um, and the, the vertical trunk piece is the trunk. So if I'm using those terms, that's what, um, that's what those mean. Um, sure I have everything. Yeah, and so then, like I had said um, a couple slides ago, uh, you'll get the, that trunk and those cordons, and then any growth that's coming out of the cordons to that point, you're just going to let kind of go and drape over those wires. You're not going to train them along the wire. You don't want to do that. You're going to let it go up and over. Because all of those canes that come up are temporary. You're going to cut off pretty much all of those every year. Um, the trunk and the cordon is really the only thing that is going to stay for more than a year. So every year, you're going to cut all those canes, those kind of longer branching things that go out with all the leaves on them. Um, and you're going to cut them back to just like maybe four to six inches. Um, you're gonna look for buds, um, just like kind of a little place where the leaf would come out. And you're gonna leave a little stub of those canes so that there's like two to three buds, which is, you know, like I said, just like four to six inches or so. Um, and the reason you do that is those buds are what next year the fruit is gonna come from. And so if you cut them back, it means that fruit is all gonna stay close to that cordon, which is, means it's gonna be easier for you to harvest. It means it's not going to be as much strain on the trellis as if there's grapes, you know, hanging way out um, on these kind of cane growths. And it allows you to control it more easily so that it doesn't overproduce. Um, because like with apples and peaches and stuff like that, grapes, um, if they're not pruned and if you don't kind of manage them, they can produce too much. Um, and it can actually kind of sap some of its energy. And then the next year, you're not going to get as many grapes. And it's a whole thing. Um, so what you're looking for then is you've got, again, the trunk that's coming up. You've got two cordons, um, and those cordons for the canes, what you're, what you're aiming for is to have kind of one cane um, every six inches. So if a lot more canes than that grow, if you've got a cane every three inches, um, then you're going to cut so that um, the stub that you leave in the spring, 
like that kind of six inch stub that you leave, there's only one of those every six inches. So you would cut, you know, every, you know, if they're, if they're growing every three inches, you would cut every other one completely off. And then the ones that are left every six inches, you would cut to about a six inch long nub. Hopefully that makes sense. And I've got some pictures too that'll help, hopefully. So year one, when you plant your grape, um, if you get like a bare root grape, um, which a lot of times is what you're gonna get if you're ordering some of these uh, less conventional grapes, it'll just look like a stick. Um, a lot of times what you're gonna do is, especially if it's bushy at all, um, when it's dormant, you can cut it basically com like to nothing. You can cut it just like completely down. Um, or you cut it just to one primary um, vine. Um, and then you wanna train that vine up to that middle lower wire. Um, so you can do that with a string like you see here where somebody tied a string to this little branch and then you tie it straight up to that wire. And so then whenever that, that new vine starts growing, you just tie it to that wire until it gets up to the, that central wire. And so then by kind of that second year, it'll look something like this. So you can see that string still there that's going up and it's tied to this wire so it grew up but as you can see as it's growing grapes are very vigorous you've got all of these other things coming and side branches and everything so that second spring you're going to cut it to where it's just just this just the trunk um, just up here so all so this secondary one that came off you're going to completely remove that all these other little side branches you're going to completely remove those you're going to leave it just to this just the trunk and so then um, as spring progresses and you start getting um, leaves to come out, there's gonna be leaves all along this trunk, uh, which you don't want. So you can see um, from the final picture here, um, it's labeled after disbudding, you're just gonna pop off all the little buds, all the little leaves, all along that trunk, except for these top couple. Because uh, this second year, what you're trying to get to grow is those cordons. You're trying to get those side branches. So you can see there's one um, on each side. Now my cursor's not showing up. Um, and you're going to train those to go off and you're going to tie them to that central wire to get them to grow straight along that wire. And that's your goal for that second year is to get those cordons established. So the first year you're trying to get the trunk, second year you're trying to get the cordons. So then year three um, in the spring, it's going to look something like this. So there might be all sorts of growth that comes along. And so that's when you're really, you're going to tie and you're going to remove all of them except one good one going in either direction and then formally tie those. And the length that you're going for too, you know, people ask me that sometimes, the length of the cordon is whatever half the distance is to the next grape. So if you're, you know, if your grapes are spaced 10 feet apart, you want that nice T shape. So each arm of the T is gonna be five feet because you know, there's a trunk and then you've got five feet, five feet, and there's gonna be a grape 10 feet away that's also gonna have a branch coming out five feet. So you want them to just kind of meet you don't want them overlapping and tangling all over the place because that'll just make your life more confusing to try and figure out, you know, which ones do you cut, which ones don't you cut. So you're going to let that grow. You're going to tie those cordons down and you're going to cut it halfway to the next grape. And then hopefully that next grape will have grown up to that same spot and they'll basically meet each other. So that's your goal for that kind of third spring. Um, and so then uh, that third spring, all that growth that you get, that's when you're going to start training it to go um, out to the sides, like this center picture here. If you're looking down the row, it'll kind of drape over those side wires. Um, if you're looking at it from the, from the side, um, it'll look something like this, where you'll have kind of that trunk coming up, the main cordons, and you'll just have these drooping things sticking out, and that's fine. Just let them go. Uh, and then after pruning um, annually, uh, like we talked about, you'll, you're going to see that trunk, those cordons, and then you're going to see these little um, nubs coming out. So those are the canes from last year that you left every six inches on the cordon um, that your grapes are going to grow from this year uh, or the year that you, that you prune them. So again, hopefully all that pruning makes sense. Um, so then in terms of maintenance other than pruning, um, Again, if you're growing these, these really disease resistant varieties that we recommend, you're gonna have minimal disease control needed. Um, you, you might still get diseases. I mean, you know, things still happen. Even the healthiest person in the world can still get sick. Might still happen. 
Um, the most common diseases are fungal leaf diseases um, or fungal fruit diseases, um, particularly powdery and downy mildew um, are really common leaf diseases. Um, and then black rot is, is, the, is the one that we talked about a little earlier that's uh, quite a bit more devastating. The easiest way to kind of treat these and, um, and treat, what I really mean is, uh, is prevention. Um, if you have a really rainy spring or if, you know, last year you had powdery or downy mildew or, um, or black rot or something, and so you know that the, that the plant is a little bit more susceptible, um, you can do these preventative sprays. Um, and it's really the best way they work. Once you have an infection, it's really hard to get rid of it. Um, even if you want to use some pretty heavy duty chemicals, uh, most of them really are preventative and not treatment. Um, the kind of lowest tech, you know, least toxic, most easily accessible way um, to prevent these diseases is, is dairy. Um, milk um, has a, an enzyme in it that when it reacts with the ultraviolet light in the sun, um, becomes really toxic to fungal spores. Um, and milk and, and other dairy products are also really high in calcium and phosphorus and potassium, um, which are good foliar fertilizers for your plant as well. So um, it can help act as kind of a fungal infection prevention and also add a little bit of a, of a boost to your plants. Um, I put whey on here. I like whey just because um, it's a waste product of dairy and you can also readily get it in a powdered form. So you don't have to keep just like a jug of milk sitting around. Um, it's a little easier to just like have in your garden shed and you can pull it out, dilute it in water. If you're using dried powder and you can do the same with, um, with dried milk too, it works the same way. Um, but if you're working with a dried um, dairy product like that, um, all you need is two tablespoons of that powder per gallon of water. So you just dissolve that in there, spray the whole plant down, you know, tops of leaves, bottoms of leaves, fruit. Um, and again, like I said, it's really, it's a preventative. Um, so it's best to do that about once a week. Um, if you know that you're going to have fungal issues or if you want to make sure to try and avoid those fungal issues. Um, there are more powerful organic options available as well, um, specifically sulfur. Sulfur has been used for a couple hundred years um, for disease management in grapes, um, but uh, you do have to, it's harder to find. Um, and it is uh, very uh, acidic, so you need to be a little more careful when handling it. It's a very fine powder. So you need to be more careful, making sure you're not going to be breathing in that dust, making sure you're not getting it in your eyes, things like that. Um, so the dairy is just an, a nice one to do. Uh, in terms of pests, uh, if you're, again, if you're growing these varieties that we recommend, um, the main pest that you're going to have is the grape berry moth, um, which is just like a little, it's a moth that lays a little caterpillar that will um, eat your grapes. Uh, and it is a lepidopterin. Um, so it's in the same family as coddling moths, um, cabbage loopers, uh, a lot of, of agricultural pests, um, and they are susceptible to Bt, which is just a bacterial um, organic spray that you can use that's pretty pretty readily available. Um, and so if you start getting that pest, you can spray Bt, um, and it'll take care of it pretty well for you. So uh, that's uh, that's the the spiel on grapes. Like I said, that's what we're going to talk about most. Um, and a lot of the information from here is translatable to the kiwis and the muscadines, um, which is why we're going to be able to run through those a little faster. So hardy kiwis are the other main, um, the other main woody fruit vine um, that you can grow in St. Louis. And a lot of times people are, are surprised to hear that. So I would say, yes, you can grow kiwis here, uh, but not this one. Um, not the one that you're probably thinking, not the the big, you know, egg size kind of fuzzy kiwi that you get at the grocery store. This is the one that you can grow. Um, so what the difference is, is they're, they're the same family. Uh, they taste the same. When you cut it open, the inside looks the same, uh, like you can see from the picture here, but this, it's, the size is different. It's much smaller. It's about the size of a grape. Um, and as you can see in this last picture, they kind of grow in clusters. Um, so kind of grape-esque. And it's really not, and they don't, and they're not fuzzy, as you can see. So what's nice about that is uh, they are much smaller, but you can just eat the whole thing. Uh, if you don't have that real, I mean, you can eat the fuzzy skin of a kiwi too, but a lot of people don't like to. Um, so they're tender enough and not fuzzy enough that it's, um, that most people, they just pop the whole thing like a grape, um, except it's a kiwi, which is pretty nice. Uh, they really have no pests or diseases whatsoever, um, at least at this point. They're relatively new to the continent. 
um, so they don't really have any don't really have anything, and they're not uh, closely related to any other fruit uh, that we that we grow. So you're not you're not going to have the issues of like, oh, well, I'm already growing apples, and so this disease is already here. They really don't share any of those things. So for the most part, they're pretty low maintenance in that regard, um, and they'll grow here. So what's not to love? Um, well, they're first of all very slow to start producing compared to other fruits. Um, for a lot of people, this is uh, this is kind of a deal breaker um, because a lot of people want you know they want a, a fast return, and fruits already a much longer wait than your vegetables. But um, and as you can see there, I mean they can take five, maybe even nine years sometimes. I mean they can be very slow to start producing. Um, but once they are established, they grow very aggressively, um, so they will. Um, fill in an area pretty quickly, um, but it can sometimes be too aggressive. Um, they need more pruning uh, than other things. Um, generally, you're going to prune them actually not only in the in the dormant season, but um, once or even maybe twice during the growing season, just to keep them from kind of sprawling all over the place. Um, the other, the big downside for a lot of people that have limited space, um, especially in kind of uh, small urban lots is that you need both a male and a female plant to produce fruit. You can have up to six females per male. And so, you know, if you have enough space for, for several um, vines, um, you know, you, you don't need a bunch of males. Um, but if you've only got enough space for two vines, then, you know, half of the vine isn't going to produce any fruit because it's a male. Um, there is kind of one exception to that. There's this variety listed here, um, ISS. AI, I don't know if that's Isaiah, um, that is self-pollinating, uh, but at least in my experience, hasn't always done that well um, here. Uh, I feel like a lot of people, it's either kind of hit or miss. Um, it really likes it colder um, than, than we are, uh, and it also seems to grow pretty slowly, um, and so it can, it can take a while to kind of fill in a trellis um, in that regard. So, uh, so that is one option if that's you know, kind of a deal breaker for you that you need multiple vines, um, but it's not quite as aggressive, doesn't yield quite as high. Uh, and the other kind of downside is although they are incredibly cold tolerant, they can survive very, very cold temperatures. They're not used to our erratic winters. So if we have a particularly late frost, it can be a problem where they'll bloom and then the, the late frost will kind of hit the blooms and you won't have fruit that year. Um, so that can be an issue for some people. Although again, if you're in um, the city, that's less common. Um, a lot of times the, the city will kind of avoid those late frosts because of the heat island effect. But um, So those are kind of the downsides of them. <clears throat> These are the recommended varieties uh, that we have. Um, by far the most common one and the one that has proved itself um, the most is this one that's commonly just called um, Anna, um, but it's Anna Naznaya. Uh, a lot of these varieties are from uh, Russia. Um, or from breeding programs in the U.S., but a lot of the stock originally came from Russia. Um, so this, uh, if you're just looking for one good variety, um, Anna is is the one that we know does well here. Uh, these other ones on here I like to put because it'll it helps kind of stagger the harvest for you. So 55 hardy um, is very early, um, so it'll usually ripen by the end of July, early August. Um, Ken's Red will you know ripen two to three weeks after that 55 hardy. And then Anna will ripen about three weeks after Ken's Red. Um, so it kind of helps stagger the harvest for you over a couple months. Um, and Ken's Red is called that because it is red. That's what this picture off to the right here is. So it's kind of a, a cool one to grow if you want you know, a red kiwi. Uh, Michigan State and Meter are also um, two others that, um, that should do pretty well here. In terms of planting, um, these need to be spaced further than your grapes. Uh, like I said, they're they're pretty aggressive. So you're usually going to space these about 15 feet apart. Uh, you want to make sure that you have an, uh, not only a male pollinator, but an appropriate one. So there's actually two species of hardy kiwis. Um, there's Actinidia arguta, I don't know, I don't know Latin, um, is what you want, the arguta one, not the kolomitka. Um, and a lot of places will sell both. Um, the Kolomitka uh, is what you would grow um, north of here in areas that have colder winters. Um, the Arguta um, yields better, uh, but it's not quite as cold hardy. So all the varieties that I have listed back here, these are all 
the Arguta. So if you get one of these, if you get Anna, and then you get a Kolomitka male pollinator, it's not going to work. Um, so you want to make sure you have the right male pollinator, and it should be listed um, if you're buying them, or if you're buying an Anna, and it, you know, and they say it'll come with a male pollinator. It's pretty safe to assume that they're giving you the appropriate one. Unlike with the grapes, you want to maintain a weed-free area, especially grass, three-foot radius. Um, you can do mulch, plastic, herbicide, whatever you need to use, whatever you want to use. Um, and make sure to keep water during that, um, that first year especially. But like with the grapes, you know, if we have drought um, conditions, um, long dry periods, it's best to water those even in future years just to maximize your yield production. The kiwi trellis is very um, similar to the Munson trellis. You're going to need a lot of the same uh, materials, the same anchors. Um, you know, same four by four posts, you're going to have cross arms in the same way. The difference is the cross arm, instead of being two foot wide, is going to be five feet wide. Um, and there are going to be five wires. Um, and that middle wire is not going to be lower. They're all going to be at that same height, as you can see in this picture here, just evenly spaced along that five feet um, of, the, of the trellis arm. So for the pruning, you're going to create the trunk the same way that you did with the grape. You're going to create two cordons the same way you did with the grape. Um, but then you're going to have an additional kind of permanent thing. Um, so the reason why you've got this big wide space on top is that in addition to the cordons, you're going to have these lateral branches. So you can see those here as these ones growing um, kind of um, perpendicular with the, with the wires kind of coming off from those cordons, those kind of main arm branches. Um, and in that 15 foot spacing that you have, because remember we're spacing our, our kiwis about 15 feet apart on the trellis, uh, you want to aim for 15 to 20 laterals evenly spaced. So, you know, every nine to 12 inches um, along that spacing, you want a lateral and you want them spaced, you know, in, in both directions. So you can kind of alternate back and forth. So one going this way, then another one going this way, and then another one going this way, and kind of go along the way. And then those laterals are where, um, are where your fruit is gonna form for the most part. You're not gonna get much fruit on the cordons, you're mostly gonna get them on the laterals for your, um, for your hardy kiwis. Uh, for your kiwi pruning, you're gonna be cutting off 70% of the lateral growth per year. So all that stuff that's coming off the lateral growth. Um, uh, for the females, you're gonna prune those um, in the dormant season, just like you would um, any other fruit just like you would your grapes, apples, anything else. Um, so that would be, you know, late winter, early spring. So February generally is when you're going to be doing that. Um, the males, it's usually best to wait to prune those until July. Um, and that's because the males aren't going to produce any fruit. So you don't need to, you know, worry about cutting the fruit off. The flowers are what you want. And so if you um, let them have all of their leaves in the spring, they're going to produce the maximum number of flowers um, to be able to make extra sure that you have enough flowers um, to pollinate your females that you just pruned. And so then in July, you can prune those back really heavy because the flowers are done um, and it'll help kind of contain them a little bit. Um, and then they'll still have plenty of time to grow uh, before the dormant season if you prune in July for those kiwis. Um, and this is just a picture. You can see how thick the trunks on those kiwis get because these posts here are four by four. So you can see this trunk is probably about at least four inches in diameter. And you can see how wide the arms are and how it's just kind of growing all over the place. They grow pretty dense. Um, and this wide trellis is also nice because the kiwis will kind of hang down. So you can just kind of walk underneath and you can see the kiwis and you'll just be able to pick them off. Um, so it's nice for the kiwis. So that's about it for the kiwis. Um, like I said, it's uh, a lot of it's kind of translatable from the grapes and there's really no pests or diseases. So there's really none of that that we need to talk about. So then muscadines or muscadines, um, depending on if you're from the north or the south. Um, so they are a native grape. So all of those other Munson varieties that we talk about, so they are all hybrids between the European grape and native grapes. So they get the disease resistance of the native grape, um, but they get kind of the flavor um, and the good quality of the European grape. So this muscadine is a, is a fully native grape. Um, so they were domesticated in the Southeast because before the advent of chemical sprays, um, European grapes, just could not be grown in the Southeast. It was too humid. Um, there's also a specific disease there that European grapes um, cannot survive. Um, and so the people in the Southeast, you know, several hundred years ago, um, 
she started working on domesticating them. So, I mean, Native Americans cultivated them and ate them um, for sure, but early settlers um, kind of turned them into more of a conventional crop in the way that grapes already were in, uh, in Europe, that they were more familiar with. So it is um, because of it's native, because it's very pest and disease resistant. Um, due to that, it grew. Um, the southeast is basically kind of the worst place you can imagine to grow grapes. Um, and so because it's native to that area, it's probably the easiest grape to grow. Um, very disease resistant. It's incredibly productive. The fruit is, is large, as you can see um, from this person holding it, how big that grape is. And the fruit is incredibly sweet. Um, I think there's varieties that are up to like 20. Um, I think there's some even that are approaching 25% sugar by weight. They're incredibly sweet. The catch is that most won't grow here. Um, like I said, they're native to the southeast. Um, and so most of them don't like uh, how cold our winters get here. Um, we are trialing some that are pretty promising, um, but we don't have any definitive information yet. Um, at least the ones that I've planted, they have survived the winter, but they haven't produced fruit yet. So I can't speak to how well the fruit will be or if they'll survive long term here because they've only been in the ground a couple years and our winters have been pretty mild um, compared to what they could be. Uh, they also don't ripen evil evenly. Um, so this is one of the reasons why they're not popular on a large commercial scale is because it's hard to harvest um, whenever you might get, you know, a couple grapes in the same bunch that are ripe and a couple that aren't. Um, but for backyard production, that's kind of a plus because it means that you can harvest them over a longer period of time instead of having to harvest potentially hundreds of pounds of grapes and then have to deal with them all in a, in a week or two before they go bad. Um, the other kind of catch, which isn't that big of a deal, but you just need to know about, is that they do have um, a strange pollination. So there are two types of muscadines um, from a pollination standpoint. Uh, there's those that are called female and there's those that are called self-fertile. So female muscadines need to have a self-fertile variety planted nearby it for it to produce fruit. A self-fertile variety doesn't need it. You could plant a self-fertile variety completely by itself and it will produce fruit. Um, if you plant a female variety completely by itself, it won't produce fruit. But if you have a female and a self-fertile, it will produce fruit. If you plant two females, it still won't produce fruit. Um, so you need to always have at least one self-fertile. Uh, but as long as you have a self-fertile, you can also add some female muscadine varieties as well if you want. Um, and this is just some more pictures of some of the diversity of muscadines. You can see they also come in lots of different colors um, and sizes, although they're generally big. You can see there's some small ones up here on the top right. Uh, so muscadine varieties to try. So again, these are these are all trials. No promises on any of these. But if you want to give them a shot, um, these are the ones um, that uh, have done well for that that same guy that we get our grapes from down in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, so believe it or not, their winters are actually just about as cold as ours are down in that part of Arkansas. Um, so I I feel pretty confident that they would grow well here, but just no direct experience. So take that with a with a grain of salt. And you can see they're also listed here, whether they're female or self-fertile. Uh, in terms of planting, trellising, and maintenance, if you want to give those a shot, um, like I said, they, they, are, they are much more vigorous than, uh, than the other grapes. Um, so they actually need to be spaced 20 feet apart. So they're even more vigorous than, than kiwis in that regard. Um, we would also recommend the Munson trellis for that. Um, and then, it's easiest then, since they're spaced 20 feet apart, if you just move the spacing of the posts of the Munson trellis to 20 feet so that you can just plant one um, in the center between two posts um, and just makes your life easier than having 24 foot posts and then having the spacing all weird. Um, but that's up to you. Uh, and the maintenance is the exact same as grapes. Um, the pruning is, is pretty similar. Um, diseases are, are kind of the same, um, although they have minimal disease issues, but it would be the same kind of idea. And that's it. Um, so that's kind of a, a basic rundown. Um, like I said, especially with grapes, there is more information out there than you could probably read in your entire lifetime on grapes. Um, so really any question you have, you can probably find somebody who's um, written all sorts of things about it. Um, and if you want to try different things with grapes, there's all sorts of different grape knowledge out there um, that you can find. Uh, the Kiwis are a little bit harder to find, um, but I think University of Oregon, I think, is the, is the one that has quite a bit of information on it. 
that you can find as well as just random sources. But I think the University of Oregon is kind of the main one, um, kind of main like research institution that's doing that kind of thing. Um, and then muscadines, you can find just lots of random stuff in the South um, about muscadines. Um, but like I said, the muscadines is really um, an experiment in the St. Louis area. Um, so then I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if we have them, but just uh, um, if you want to learn more or see more classes from us, um, you can follow us on any of these social media platforms. Um, Facebook is probably our most active for posting classes specifically, um, but we do informational posts, um, things like that on, on lots of our other social media. Um, our YouTube channel is where we post um, our classes um, that we've taught in the past. So uh, we were filming this class um, right now, um, and that'll be uploaded to YouTube um, once we get a chance. And also, if you liked this class or you like Gateway Greening in general, you can always donate to us um, at this uh, URL here. We are a nonprofit. We run on donations, grants, whatnot. So, uh, yeah. Do we have any questions, Megan? Nope, doesn't look like it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, cool. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, I guess we're good. Do we just get do we just get one? Nope. All right. There well, is a question. Oh, there. How can you tell the male from the female kiwi plants once they are planted? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I am not sure there is a way. Um, I'm sure there's some very good botanist would be able to tell you, um, but I do not know how to tell the difference between them. Um, other than, I mean, if you know you have both, I mean, the female will produce fruit and the male won't. Um, but other than that, I'm, I am not sure. Looks like, um, let's see. Can you have a male of one variety of kiwi with a female of a different variety and still get fruit? Um, so the, so the, the varieties that you'll get, like the, um, you know, like the Anna or the Meter or 55 Hardy, things like that. So those are all females. So there aren't male versions of that variety. Um, the males are just um, of the same species. Um, so as long as you have a male of that same species, uh, that male pollinator will pollinate any of those female varieties. So like if you planted one Anna, one meter, one fifty-five, one. Um, I can't think of it. The chem's red. Like if you planted one of each of those and just one male pollinator, that one male will pollinate all of those females, regardless of the variety. And then, um, can we grow grapes in containers? Um, you can. Um, you the the only trick with doing kind of perennial woody things in containers is that um, you if if you bring them inside uh, they're not going to get enough cold to trigger the flowering in the spring um, like if you bring it into your house um, they really need that cold so you would need to leave it outside or in like a unheated area um, but you also want to make sure that the roots don't get super frozen and thawed a bunch of times as the winter goes. Um, so if you did it in a container, it would probably be best actually to um, to bury the pot outside, either like literally in the ground or um, by heaping up a bunch of either soil or compost um, or wood chip mulch or something around the base so that the um, so that the pot isn't freezing and thawing every time that we have a warm and a cold spell, uh, but that it's still going to get that cold. Um, but, um, but otherwise, I mean, you, you can do it in a pot. Yeah. You just want, you'll want a nice, decent sized pot, um, just to give your roots as much space as possible. And then we have two questions that are very similar. Um, one person started growing kiwis and planned on letting them grow up the fence. Okay. And another person asked if you can use a fence for a trellis. Yeah, so you, so you can use a trend, uh, fence for a trellis or an arbor or a pergola or whatever you got for a trellis. Um, they are just, they're a little harder to, to prune. It's a little harder to know kind of what's old, what isn't, um, to kind of keep them thinned out. 
um, a lot of times what can happen on fences and stuff is um, it, it gets a little more tangled um, and you get a lot more older wood and the fruit really only produces on kind of last year's wood. Um, so your yields are a little harder to maintain. But um, if you like the look of, you know, foliage on a fence or you want it on, you know, a pergola to cast shade, um, you might as well grow something that's going to produce fruit too. Um, you know, if you're like picking between, well, I could grow a kiwi or I could grow, you know, I don't know, a wisteria or something. Um, growing a kiwi, even if maybe you don't get quite as much as if you did it on a trellis, you're still going to get something. Um, but yeah, the, the, the pruning is the only thing um, that kind of minimizes the use of those things if your goal is maximum production. Okay, it looks like that's it. All right, well, great. Um, well, thanks everybody. Uh, you know, stay tuned if you're, you know, if you're interested. We have, I think, our next class is next Thursday. Um, I think I'm teaching that one too. I think it's uh, building a healthy orchard ecosystem. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, um, you know, tune in next Thursday. Um, otherwise, have a have a great day. Thanks for attending.